good evening everyone on behalf of janaki devi memorial college and center for the study of developing societies hi <laughs> mohammad zubair ahmed would like to welcome you all to the session and a professor in the department of has wide range of contemporary travel writing polit contemporary political and uh, post colonial debates contemporary fiction and uh, translation in english currently she is working on antra is this uh, zubair signal moderator to take over the session okay thank you zubair uh, i'm delighted to Go ahead. Uh, thank you subel uh, i am delighted to welcome you all to this discussion session on the book competing nationalisms the sacred and political life of jagat narayan lal authored by professor rajshri chandra the event is jointly organized by the political science department of janki devi memorial college and center for for the study of developing societies but before we start the discussion i'd like to invite professor avdeen sharma director csds to introduce the session to the audience professor sharma yeah good evening everyone uh, welcome to to this evening's program as uh, dr antra said we are here to discuss uh, professor rashi chandra's uh, new book competing nationalisms the sacred and political life of jagat narayan lal uh, this event is is a is a pleasure for us for many reasons uh, we are very happy to host this together with the janki devi memorial college i believe this is the first uh, event that we are doing together and i hope we can do more in the future uh, even more it's a pleasure because uh, professor rashi chandra who's currently faculty at janki devi memorial college Uh, we have had the privilege of having her as a visiting fellow with us at csds and spent uh, uh, a full year together uh, having a wonderful time so it's 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 a pleasure to have her back uh, today evening and and discuss a book uh, a very warm welcome also on uh, uh, to professor swati pal principal of uh, jdmc uh, to our chair dr antra datta and our distinguished panelists uh, professor apurvanand and professor aditya negam indeed uh, you know like many things at csds it's, it's a quite a interesting panel uh, with the author herself <clears throat> a political scientist uh, the chair coming from english department and one panelist from hindi department and one who does not belong to a department but has his roots in political science so so we're very happy that we have a cross uh, uh, you know uh, people from different disciplinary backgrounds to discuss this very important book Uh, a finally a very hearty welcome to all of you who have joined uh, this evening and we hope we'll have a wonderful time uh, over the next hour hour and a half so th thank you and 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 back to you antra thank you so much now i'd like to invite professor swati pal principal jdmc to welcome our speakers and address the audience professor swati pal principal janki devi memorial college has been a charles wallace scholar as well as the first asian to receive the john mcgrath theater studies scholarship at edinburgh university professor pal is the author of several books on theater creative and academic writing her newspaper articles articulate her views on education and her research in drama she is the vice president of the indian association for commonwealth literature and language studies and an executive body member of the indian association for the study of australia Professor Pal has presented a number of papers at both national and international conferences and has been the recipient of several awards. 
She also translates and writes poetry. Over to you, Professor Paul. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Andhara. And of course, a very, very warm welcome to all on the forum, especially the distinguished panelists and uh, Professor Sharan. Um, I uh, have only two things to say. One, that I'm really excited about what I know is going to be an extremely stimulating discussion. And two, I would like to put on record my complete admiration for Professor Rajshri Chandra, who as a scholar, we are so proud to have as a part of our faculty. And I know that just as her book is on competing nationalisms, there would be many competing organizations wanting to grab her and make her a part of their organization. And uh, we try very hard to keep Rajshri with us. Um, this particular book I know is extremely close to her heart because um, of the fact that, because of the person she has worked on. And uh, for me, it's a, it's a, it's been a fascinating read. And yes, actually I have read it. It's been, and it's been quite difficult get laying my hands on this book because there was only one copy. So between my husband and myself, uh, you know, it was a tough fight uh, as to who uh, should lay uh, hands on it first. So it's been a really fascinating experience, but I am not the political scientist here and I am looking forward to this discussion. So warm welcome once again, heartiest congratulations for the Enith Tan Rajshri for this book and many more feathers in, in your cap in the years to come. Thank you. So uh, before I introduce the author, Professor Rajri Chandra, and our two distinguished discussants, Professor Aditya Nigam and Professor Purvanan, I'd like to introduce the book to all present here with a quote from the preface where Rajri writes, and I begin the quote, the aim of this book is to reflect upon Jagat Naran Lal's richly conflictual journey and explore the competing strands of nationalism that intersected not just his own life, but also the nationalist world that he was a part of and that we inherited in 1947. In his anxieties and competing political pursuits lay Indian nationalism's own fraught relationship with questions of identity, faith and nationhood. She goes on to say, this is in a sense a chronicle of present day conflicts foretold as each of the contradictions and anxieties play out with chilling and uncanny familiarity, unquote. This, I guess, gives us an idea of the scope of the project that the author undertakes, a task she fulfills with great scholarly flair and brings to the reading of history a rare meditative depth. The author writes the life of a man and a nation with a profound sense of empathy and is yet also unsparingly critical. And this perspective is what I call critical empathy. Congratulations, Professor Chandra, for this brilliant work. I finished reading the book in two sittings. We will hear more about the book from the author herself. We are also immensely fortunate to have with us Professor Aditya Nigam and Professor Apur Vanan, who will discuss their reading and thoughts on the book. Now a few words about the star of the show, Rajshri Chandra. Rajshri Chandra is an academic teacher and author. Most of our writing and research is at the intersection of political philosophy, law, and politics. She is the author of the book, The Cunning Rights and Knowledge as Property, and has written several articles and political commentaries. Rajshri has received the Eukary Award, the ICSSR Postdoctoral Award, the Australia India Institute's Fellowship, and a visiting fellowship from the Institute of Human Sciences, Vienna. This book, a political biography of her grandfather, rendered through the prism of nationalist history, has been generously supported by the New India Foundation Fellowship. Rajshri is a professor of political science at Janki Devi Memorial College, and we are all so awfully proud of her that she's one of us, as Professor Pal said. And she's also a visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research. Professor Aditya Nigam is a political theorist and works at the Center for the Study of Developing Societies, Delhi, and has worked on nationalism, secularism, and the formation of political identities. 
His recent work has been concerned with the decolonization of social and political theory. He is especially interested in theorizing the contemporary experience of politics, populism, and democracy in the non-West. He's currently working on a book on Marxism and the global South. Nigam also comments on contemporary political issues on the blog Kafila. He is the author of The Insurrection of Little Selves, The Crisis of Secular Nationalism in India, published in 2006, Power and Contestation, India since 1989 with Nivedita Menon in 2007, After Utopia, Modernity, Socialism and Post-Colony and the Post-Colony in 2010, Desire Named Development 2011, and Decolonizing Theory, Thinking Across Traditions 2020. A very warm welcome to you, Professor Nikam. Apoorva Nant teaches Hindi at Delhi University and writes literary and cultural criticism. He also writes on contemporary issues. Now, Professor Apoorva Nant insisted that I keep uh, his introduction short, but to this very short bio note, I'd like to add one line on behalf of many of us present here, students, teachers, citizens of this country. For us, Professor Apoorva Nand is the voice of our collective conscience. A very warm welcome to you as well, Professor Apoorva Nand. I would like to invite Rajshree to talk about her book, which will, will then be followed by a discussion by Aditya and Apoorva Nand. And we will open the session for questions at the end of the conversation. Thank you. Over to you, Rajshree. Thank you, thank you, Antara, for the generous introduction. Thank you, Professor Swati Pal, for showing your appreciation. Um, it is valued and much appreciated in return. Um, good evening to everyone. Thank you all for coming here. Uh, thank you, Janki Devi Memorial College and CSDS for organizing this event. Uh, thank you to um, Professors Swati Pal, Avdendra Sharan, Praveen Rai, uh, Department of Political Science, Janki Devi Memorial College, in particular Zubair Ahmed. Many thanks for giving my book and a lesser known freedom fighter, Jagat Narayan Lal, a forum. Uh, many thanks uh, to Aditya Nigam, Apoorva Nand, who are political analysts, commentators, writers, par excellence, and as Antara says, conscience of the, our collective conscience for engaging with my book. Uh, I hope it has been worth your while. Um, and finally, thanks to Antara Datta, colleague, friend, fellow compatriot for chairing and moderating this session. Um, let me talk a little bit about my writing process and the book itself. Uh, what I'll do is take about uh, 12 to 15 minutes to introduce the book to you, and then uh, uh, we'll move on from there. Uh, so my initial and perhaps the biggest hurdle was how to, how to write a political biography and a story of nationalism that said something new. As a deeply secular person, how to portray my very Hindu grandfather. Uh, also, how to be fair, how to be objective, and how to be truthful. Uh, these were not, before the writing process began, these seemed to be insurmountable and uh, very onerous tasks. But as I moved on, I wrote every day. Uh, it became apparent that all you needed to do was to take an honest, a step forward and to move away from either uh, apologia or exaltation of the person in question. And, uh, you know, be fair to yourself as well as to the protagonist of the book. I also was besieged by the question who would want to read a book of a, a, a small story of a forgotten patriot? How could I make something more of this other than a familial foray? Uh, there was no Azadi Kamrit Utsa four years back when I began writing, which was to fuel this project. And perhaps just as well, because it pushed me to go beyond the agenda of simply populating the nationalist pantheon and finding new heroes. Uh, it also pushed me to think of how smaller stories can tell a larger story, how they can nuance and complicate our own understanding. Uh, and help us move beyond our overcompacted understanding and telescopic view of Indian national movement. 
and Indian nationalism itself. Uh, my endeavor was small. It was not over ambitious. It was not to present a new story of Indian nationalism that was vastly different or that, uh, that counter way, uh, provided a counter to a prevailing view of history. It was simply to do three things. Uh, one was to tell a story of Jagat Narayan Lal in a way that the personal did not shy away from being political and uh, to tell a story in a way that did not erase either my politics or sanitize his. Second, it was to view Jagat Narayan Lal's conflicted journey through multiple nationalist pathways as an archive rather than to apportion blame or to venerate. And the third was to use Jagat Narayan Lal's experiences, perspectives, choices, and lens to offer a conceptual history. So I was using my own training as a political scientist uh, to offer a conceptual history of nationalist idioms. Uh, so in a sense, what I've done is try to explore nationalism's varied ideological architecture uh, that also provides a more accurate assessment of the continuities and changes in their contemporary articulations. Uh, let me acquaint you with Jagat Narayan Lal, who happens to be my grandfather. Uh, he was a freedom fighter. He was a member of the Indian National Congress as also of the Hindu Mahasabha. He was its All India's uh, a secretary in 1926. He uh, had started a Sri Krishna press in, his, in the premises of his own residence. And he edited a journal called Mahavir for which uh, he, was, he also faced sedition charges and obscenity charges at one point of time. Uh, he was a member of the Constituent Assembly. Uh, he was the member of the first much lesser known Linguistic Reorganization Commission, which was set up in 1948, known as uh, the Dar Commission. It had only three members. One was uh, uh, Justice Dar, the other was Panna Lal, and the third was Jagat Narayan Lal. But above all, he was also a very scholarly person. Uh, he was a poet, a writer, uh, a scholar, a philosopher who had deep interest in both Western and Indic philosophy. Uh, uh, his diaries and notes also give us a glimpse of a man whose quest for uh, sort of self-realization and spiritual uh, regeneration and yearning for freedom, both personal and political was boundless. You know, not a page of his of his memoir is is uh, uh, is free of this yearning that he constantly expresses. Uh, however, what was also true was that his spiritual and ascetic consciousness and his nationalist uh, 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 pers uh, his nationalist ideologies or perspectives uh, were from two different cosmic worlds. In a sense, his spiritual and his nationalist genealogies but from two different cosmic worlds, if I can put it that way. Uh, one sought to free the self through an act of self-knowing and detachment and pursuit of asceticism. And the other, which was the nationalist practice, sought to institutionalize and entitle the possessive self. So nationalism mobilized the sacrifice of an ascetic Jagat Narayan Lal, as also of many other freedom fighters. But in doing so, it also displaced his personal quest for self-realization and submerged it in competing visions of the na nation state. And his political journey, that is, which is why his political journey remained conflicted and self-admittedly ridden with many anxieties. Um, as you would have come to know, he was a very religious and spiritual person. Uh, his religiosity marked his place on the right in the Congress and his religiosity also tempted him to make politics an arena for representation of Hindu interests. However, the more he attempted to align his religiosity with politics, make politics a representational arena for identity and faith, the more disillusioned he became, often finding the path to quote him thorny and riddled with many anxieties. Uh, the book travels with him he travels with Jagat Narayan Lal on his nationalist journeys to four pathways. And these are four idioms that I have culled out from his life story, as well as the uh, nationalist world that he was a part of. And each of these four idioms, <clears throat> uh, the first being ascetic nationalism, the second being Hindu nationalism, 
third being anti-colonial nationalism, and fourth, uh, civic nationalism. These are all my categories. Uh, these form the four core chapters of the book, each of them internally uh, conflicted and variegated. Uh, just want to run through these four idioms uh, so as to give you a sense of where this book, what this book wants to say. Uh, so the, the first idiom, which is that of, or the first pathway, if you can call it that, the first idiom of ascetic nationalism uh, was, as I mentioned, internally variegated and conflicted. And here I want to say that there was no ideal template of asceticism. He was deeply influenced by the principle of karma yoga of the Gita, but it was not like the karma yoga was an ideal template to which, through, on, uh, as a, uh, against which we measure each person's ascetic practice. Uh, in a sense, we can uh, probably compile all these varying ascetic practices as forming a particular ascetic lore, as I uh, mentioned in the book too. Um, his ascetic consciousness drew heavily from Gandhi, but it's important to understand that it was different from the code of self-cultivation or anushilan that influenced the 20th century Hindu nationalist activity and its construction of a Hindu male subject, uh, and I'm quoting Milind Vakankar here, construction of a Hindu male subject poised in a stance of permanent provocation towards the Muslim male other. For Jagat Narayan Lal, the search for an ascetic self had far deeper roots and motivations than the instrumentalities of the national movement. That said, uh, Jagat Narayan Lal never quite uh, inhabited the ascetic consciousness, uh, inhabited ascetic consciousness with the political wisdom of a Gandhi or with the spiritual depth of a Vivekanand. Uh, and as I have mentioned earlier, he remained uh, riddled with many anxieties. Uh, there are many complaints throughout the book. He mentions that he's uh, falling down an abyss at one point of time because he's not able to reconcile his spiritual and political. He says, I wish to commit suicide. Uh, he, there are times when he says, I feel I'm slipping down constantly. So this disjuncture between the spiritual quest for asceticism and the political quest political nationalist quest was, was, uh, was deep and it was articulated uh, uh, many times and very often. The second uh, uh, idiom of nationalism that he, the second pathway that he walked was that of as a Hindu nationalist, as I mentioned, he was a member of the Hindu Mahasabha, uh, but his life journey uh, helped me to understand that not all Hindu subjects were constructed in terms of an other. Not all Hindu nationalist subjects were constructed in terms of an other. Some were constructed as a representation of Hindu sensibilities that were more sentimental than political. The former, of course, having the proclivity to sp spill into uh, <clears throat> more communalized forms in times of heightened tensions, but yet with a distinction which is uh, probably worth noting and preserving. Uh, also worth noting is that one of Jagat Babu's deepest disenchantment stemmed from uh, the gaping gap that he discovers between the promise of political Hinduism and spiritual Hinduism. Uh, the third idiom that I refer to in the book is that of anti-colonial nationalism. Uh, and this particular nationalist discourse may appear straightforward because there was a national enemy to be fought uh, however, even here, there remains a conflicted, uh, differentiated commitment, uh, commitment and a latent tension whose tug we feel even today. Uh, one of the primary reasons was because as a nation, uh, our inherited culture lacked the vocabulary of modern nationhood and democracy. And Indian nationalism had to re-equip itself mostly by drawing from Western standards of liberal democratic nationalism. So while its posturing was anti-colonial, the aspiration was of, for Western values, uh, the aspiration for Western values of democratic nationhood and uh, democratic liberal, liberal democratic institutions remained. Uh, so giving an example from Jagat Narayan Lal, uh, despite, despite being very cognizant of uh, Hindu civilizational ethos, 
He, for example, cites examples of many modern constitutions in the Constituent Assembly and their commitments to free press, uh, freedom of speech, socioeconomic rights. And he says he wants to be, he wants the Indian constitution to be ahead of those constitutions. He lobbies against uh, differentiated cultural rights that translate into right to propagate religion, lobbies against uh, linguistic, <clears throat> linguistic reorganization of the states, against inclusion of the term secular. So there was an odd mix of wanting to be modern and wanting to be, <clears throat> excuse me, of wanting to be Indian. So as Partha Chatterjee says, uh, we, uh, we could not do so simply by imitating the alien culture for then the nation would lose its distinctive identity. So anti-colonialism rejected the alien intruder but accepted the value of the standard set by the alien culture, namely that of liberal democracy, equal individual rights, rule of law, secularism, progress, and above all, the modern nation state. Uh, the fourth idiom that I refer to in the book is that of civic nationalism. Uh, Jagat Narayan Lal eventually sought resolution of his multiple beliefs and contradictions in the ethos of civic nationalism. But even here, there is a variegated story and internal contradiction and or a conflict, if you will. Uh, despite imbibing the ethos of civic nationhood and becoming its vocal practitioner, uh, Jagat Babu's civic consciousness was not the same as that of Nehru's or an Ambedkar's. Nehru's embrace of liberal democracy and um, Ambedkar's of social justice had less ambival ambivalent and deeper, uh, strongly liberal roots. Yet Jagat Babu's conception of citizenship transcending community is closer to Nehru and Ambedkar than his politics would suggest. He chose to uphold the key principles of liberal democratic citizenship, uh, the Irish citizenship being uh, uh, one of the exemplars and, and uh, uh, standards for him. Uh, so he becomes, uh, he uh, becomes, uh, he proposes uh, principles of liberal democratic uh, citizenship, notwithstanding his Hinduness. Uh, there are two quick points that I want to make here about the term civic and nationalism. And this is one of the under acknowledged features of civic nationalism, which is, which is that the two terms may end up with conflicting mandates, particularly in a culturally diverse country like India. The, because civic implies even those individual freedoms that include the freedom to privilege your cultural, religious, or linguistic, linguistic identity above that of the nationalist identity. In contrast, nationalism thrives on the idiom of homogeneity, of unity, of oneness, of similitude. similitude. Uh, so the functional imperative, imperative of nationalism is always to tame the cultural profusion of hundreds of languages, ethnicities, religions, and other cultural markers. The imperative of civic contrasts with the imperative of the national. So there are two conflicting mandates as it were here. Uh, it's interesting how it translated for Jagat Narayan Lal. As far as the religious and linguistic identities and rights were concerned, he advocated their subordination to goals of unity and solidarity of the nation. But as far as the individual rights go, like free speech, free press, etc., he stood firmly in support for them. This is an interesting bifurcation and one that reflects how a civic consensus will always have a built-in majoritarian bias. Um, so the, the other quick point that I wish to make is that as a Again, one of the lesser acknowledged features of civic nationalism is that the distance from ethnic nationalism is not very well defined. As a normative and political site, the idea of civic nationalism does not have a well defined secular content that stands in sharp contrast with ethno nationalism. <clears throat> in its minimalist avatar, civic nationalism will always retain a potential for hierarchical and majoritarian core rather than the full and equal recognition of difference that secularism demands. So India chose the path of civic nationalism, retaining a majoritarian propensity that was latent in the best of times. 
sporadic in aberrant, aberrant times, and I'm quoting from the book here, and actively manifest in the worst. Jagatnar and Lal walked this path, attempting to combine goals of unity with the principles of liberty and equality without being religion neutral, as was the case with many, if not most nationalists then and now. <clears throat> Often a very bright line is drawn between to contrast good nationalism and bad nationalism, civic and ethnic nationalism in the works of Christoph Jaffrelot, for example, uh, Shashi Tharoor more recently. Uh, but in my book, I argue that how sharply or fuzzily the line between civic and ethnic nationalism is drawn is a matter of political choice and political will. The rubric and the idiom of civic nationalism happily makes space for both. This, in short, is what the book is trying to say through the lens of Jagat Narayan Lal's life and politics. The importance of a legacy like Jagat Narayan Lal lies not in its defense or blame or exaltation, but in a reconnaissance of a nationalist journey and of the unnegotiated embedded contradictions that have become part of our collective uh, inheritance. Thank you. Thank you, Rajshree, for this absolutely fascinating uh, presentation, a very succinct presentation of a very complex and wonderfully written book. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'd like to call upon uh, Professor Purvanand to share his views on the book and start the discussion. Professor Purvanand. शुक्रिया राजश्री यह किताब लिखने के लिए जब यह किताब मेरे हाथ में आई तब मुझे पता का कि जगत नारायण रोड की हाल है और मुझे लगा कि हम एक शहर में रहते हैं और सालों तक सड़क से गुजरे लेकिन उस सड़क का नाम जिस पर है उसकी जिंदगी में कितनी सड़कें थी और कितनी गलियां थी कितनी गुत्तियां थी उनसे हमारा परिचय जाने की बात होता है और वो भी इत्तेफाक से होता है मैं लाला जगत नारायण लाल को भी एक तरह से जानता था बहुत सही तौर पर और राजश्री को भी लेकिन इस रिश्ते को तो किताब जाने के बाद लेकिन यह किताब अपने दादा की याद से ज्यादा है जैसा राजश्री के परिचयात्मक वक्तव्य से गया और मैंने किताब पढ़ते हुए राष्ट्र को कहा था कि मुझे सबसे ज्यादा आकर्षित जिस उद्धरण ने किया और उसमें अपनी बात शुरू करना चाहता हूं वह इंस्टेड ऑफ बीइंग यूनाइटेड बाय कॉमन हिस्टोरिकल एंटीसिडेंट्स द पास्ट ऑफ हिंदूज एंड मुस्लिम्स इज अ पास्ट ऑफ म्यूचुअल एनिमोसिटीज एंड डिस्ट्रक्शन बोथ in the political as well as in the religious fields the prospects might perhaps be different if the past of the two communities can be forgotten both hence the importance of forgetfulness as a factor in building a nation aur ye mujhe bahut dilchasp hua ki laga aur bahut zaruri aur mujhe latin america kavi हिमनेस की याद आई जिन्होंने कहा था कि फॉरगेटफुलनेस से एक बहुत जरूरी चीज है अगर हम अपने आप को बनाए रखना चाहते हैं एक मनुष्य के तौर पर और एक समाज के तौर पर और यह बात उल्टी है जब हम बार बार कहते हैं कि हमारे लिए स्मृति बहुत जरूरी है स्मृति से ज्यादा स्मृति कई बार शायद हमारे वर्तमान को और भविष्य को बनाए रखने के लिए आवश्यक होती है और ये स्मृतियां जरूरी नहीं है कि तथ्यों पर आधारित हों क्योंकि जब हम तथ्यों से स्मृतियों को सत्यापित करने लगते हैं और बतलाने लगते हैं कि आपकी यह स्मृति गलत है और आपकी यह स्मृति सही है तो अक्सर हम अपनी काल्पनिक स्मृतियों को जिन स्मृतियों में हम विश्वास करना चाहते हैं उनकी रक्षा में हम अधिक आक्रामक हो जाते हैं और इसलिए Uh, मुझे यह उदाहरण जो लाला जगत नारायण लाल का ही उदाहरण है यह मुझे बहुत महत्वपूर्ण जान पड़ा और राष्ट्र के निर्माण में और राष्ट्र की यात्रा में 
स्मृति से ज्यादा कई बार स्मृतियों का महत्व है और ये चीज मुझे एक एक दूसरे कोण से प्रेमचंद के नजदीक मिली गई प्रेमचंद जो बार बार कहते थे और जयशंकर प्रसाद को उन्होंने कहा उनके ऐतिहासिक उपन्यासों और उनके ऐतिहासिक रचनाओं और नाटकों के संदर्भ में कि मुझे इतिहास में दिलचस्पी नहीं है कई लोगों को प्रेमचंद अनैतिहासिक लगते हैं प्रेमचंद में गहराई की कमी लगती है क्योंकि उनमें ऐतिहासिक स्मृति नहीं है जैसे प्रसाद में है इसलिए प्रसाद में उदात्तता दिखलाई पड़ती है और प्रेमचंद में कई लोगों को नहीं दिखलाई पड़ती लेकिन प्रेमचंद को इतिहास और स्मृति और इतिहास जो कि स्मृतियों का ही एक तरह से संचित रूप है उसके खतरे मालूम थे जब उस इतिहास को आप एक राष्ट्र की कल्पना करने के लिए इस्तेमाल करना चाहते और तब तथ्यों का कोई अर्थ नहीं रहता है लेकिन यह एक पक्ष है जिसने मुझे आकर्षित किया यह जीवनी ने कहा कि यह एक राजनीतिक जीवनी है एक राजनीतिक व्यक्ति की जीवनी है लेकिन मुझे राजनीति शास्त्र से ज्यादा एक साहित्यिक प्रति यह मालूम पड़ी जिस तरह इसको बुना गया है और जिस प्रकार एक व्यक्ति की यात्रा को बहुत ही सहानुभूति के साथ जैसा अंतरा ने कहा कि एक एक सहानुभूतिपूर्ण आलोचना या आलोचनात्मक सहानुभूति के साथ एक यात्रा में खुद राष्ट्रीय अपने दादा के साथ चलते हैं और उनके उन उलझनों को नोट करने की कोशिश करती हैं जिनसे होकर वे गुजर रहे हैं लाला जगत नारायण लाल को वे कहती हैं कि वे गांधी और नेहरू और बाकी लोगों के सामने शायद उतने बड़े व्यक्तित्व तो नहीं है राष्ट्र खुद ही इस किताब में लिखती है लेकिन मेरे लिहाज से वो तो पूरा दौर जिस दौर को हम उपनिवेशवाद विरोधी आंदोलन का दौर कहते हैं वो उदात व्यक्तित्वों का दौर था सब्लाइम कैरेक्टर्स या ऐसे लोग जो आ, अपने आप को सब्लिमेज करने या अपना उदात्तीकरण करने के लिए और इस किताब में स्वयं इन्होंने राष्ट्र ने लिखा है एथिक ऑफ अभ्यास अभ्यास की एक नैतिकता अभ्यास एक बहुत महत्वपूर्ण तत्व है जिसमें आप आत्म का निर्माण कर रहे हैं और राष्ट्र के लिए जब आप काम कर रहे हैं तो इस भावना से नहीं कि आप किसी और के लिए काम कर रहे हैं बल्कि आप स्वयं अपने निर्माण के साथ कर रहे हैं नेहरू की बात मुझको याद आती है जो गांधी के संदर्भ में उन्होंने कही है कि गांधी की खासियत यह थी कि उन्होंने हम जै नेहरू खुद अपने बारे में लिखते हैं कि हम जैसे साधारण लोगों को एक लंबे समय तक एक बहुत उदात स्तर पर प्रतिष्ठित कर दिया और बहुत लंबे समय तक उस उदात स्तर पर रखा है यानी हम खुद से संघर्ष करते हैं जैसा खुद इसमें लाला जगत नारायण लाल का एक उदाहरण है कि आ, मैं आ, कोई प्रतिज्ञा लेता हूं तो उसमें यथा शक्य की जगह नहीं रहती और यह गांधी से वे सीखते हैं कि अगर मैं कोई संकल्प कर रहा हूं कोई प्रतिज्ञा कर रहा हूं तो फिर मैं अपने आप को छूट नहीं देता मैं अपने साथ जितनी जरूरी हो उतनी निर्ममता बरतने की कोशिश करता हूं और अपने आप को अधिकतम परीक्षा में डालता हूं तो यह यात्रा जो लाला जगत नारायण लाल की है खुद को बनाने की और बहुत पहले से मैं सोचता रहा हूं अक्सर व्यक्तित्वों के बारे में हम हम में से बहुत लोगों की यात्रा वामपंथी आंदोलनों से होती हुई आगे बढ़ी है और एक समय हमें यह बताया जाता था और हम भी यह मानते थे कि व्यक्तियों का महत्व नहीं है जो सामाजिक प्रक्रियाएं होती हैं ऐतिहासिक प्रक्रियाएं होती हैं वे व्यक्ति निरपेक्ष होती हैं और वस्तुनिष्ठ होती हैं लेकिन धीरे धीरे मुझे ऐसा लगने लगा कि व्यक्तियों का काफी बहुत महत्व होता है और व्यक्तियों के निर्णय बहुत महत्वपूर्ण होते हैं इसलिए एक ऐतिहासिक दौर में व्यक्ति किस प्रकार निर्णय ले थे ले रहे थे क्या काम कर रहे थे उसको समझना हम लोगों के लिए बहुत ही आवश्यक हो और और फिर व्यक्तित्व तो बनते कैसे हैं और दो तरह के व्यक्तित्व तो 
होते हैं जो मैं सोचता रहूं अक्सर इसके बारे में एक जो ईमानदार व्यक्तित्व होते हैं और दूसरे जो रणनीतिक व्यक्तित्व होते हैं आप कह सकते हैं ऑनेस्ट और स्ट्रेटेजिक और जो ऑनेस्ट या ईमानदार हैं वे एक एक लिहाज से काफी आरक्षित होते हैं या वॉलरेबल होते हैं और वो वॉलरेबल हैं तो डिफेंसलेस भी हैं और खुद को वो कोई किलेबंद करना भी नहीं चाहते हैं अगर उनके ऊपर आरोप लगे तो जैसे जगत नारायण लाल के साथ उनकी पोती की ये बहस है कि आपका आपका जो हिंदूवाद है या जो आपका हिंदूपन है वह कैसे एक द्वंद्व में उसका रिश्ता एक द्वंद्व द्वंद्व भरा रिश्ता बनता है राष्ट्रवाद की उस समझ से जिसे आप धर्मनिरपेक्ष समझ कह सकते हैं या जिसे आप सिविक नेशनलिज्म की समझ कह सकते हैं लेकिन चूंकि वह व्यक्तित्व तो ईमानदार व्यक्तित्व तो है इसलिए वह हिंदू नेशनलिज्म या हिंदू राष्ट्रवाद के दौर से आगे निकलकर कर सिविक नेशनलिज्म के दौर में पहुंच सकते और इस प्रकार के व्यक्तित्व तो वो चाहे पंडित मदन मोहन मालवीय का हो या लाला लाजपत राय को पढ़ते समय भी मुझे लगा कि लाला लाजपत राय से बहुत सारी बहसें हो सकती हैं लेकिन उन्हें स्ट्रेटेजिक पर्सनालिटी शायद नहीं कहा जा सकता वैसे ही लाला जगत नारायण लाल स्ट्रेटेजिक पर्सनालिटी नहीं है उनकी बहसें बहुत साफ हैं उनके एतराजात बहुत साफ हैं और और अपनी बातें वे करते हैं और फिर वो अपने आप को धीरे धीरे बदलते भी चलते हैं हिंदू महासभा से अलग होने का जो उनका उनका निर्णय है और वह भी एक क्रम है क्रमिक तौर पर वह अलग होते हैं हिंदू महासभा से और वापस कांग्रेस में पूरी तरह से चले जाते हैं आ, उस हिस्से को पढ़ना भी हम लोगों के लिए बहुत उपयोगी है खासकर आज के समय में जब ऐसा लगता है कि यात्रा उल्टी हो गई है यानी लाला जगत नारायण लाल ने जो यात्रा की अब वहां से यात्रा उलट गई है और बहुत सारी आ, बहुत सारे लोग और हमारी पूरी राजनीति और हमारी समझ सिविक नेशनलिज्म से उल्टी दिशा में पड़ रही है तो लाला जगत नारायण लाल अगर आज रहते तो इस उल्टी यात्रा को कैसे देखते और मुझे राष्ट्रीय का के अंतिम इस जीवनी के अंतिम हिस्से में आ, सिविक नेशनलिज्म के भीतर छिपा हुआ यह खतरा जिसके तरफ उन्होंने इशारा किया है कि उसमें हमेशा एक बहुसंख्यकवादी खतरा जोखिम उसमें झांकता रहता है आ, आप उससे उसको अलग नहीं कर सकते जिसकी चर्चा अभी खुद उन्होंने की और इस इसलिए उससे उसको बचाया कैसे जाए आ, कैसे आप सिविक नेशनलिज्म में डिफ जिन जो विविधता है या डिफरेंसेस हैं या डाइवर्सिटी है और उसके साथ भारत जैसे समाज में यहाँ इतनी ज्यादा असमानता है और जहाँ पारंपरिकता एक एक दूसरे ढंग से आक्रामक है उसमें आप कानून के जरिए उससे कैसे लड़ेंगे और यह बात अभी पिछले दो तीन दिन में हमें दिखलाई पड़ रही है जब मैरिटल रेप को लेकर दिल्ली उच्च न्यायालय में बहस चल रही है और उससे जो सीवने उधड़ी हैं और जिस तरह की बहस आपको बाहर दिखलाई पड़ी है और जो बेचैनियां बाहर दिखलाई पड़ रही है कि अगर आपने इसको क्रिमिनलाइज कर दिया तो फिर भारतीय परिवार का भारतीय पारिवारिक संस्था का क्या हो और तब हमें पता चलता है कि सत्तर साल के तथा कथित सिविक नेशनलिज्म की प्रैक्टिस एक संविधान का अभ्यास करते हुए हम एक इस बिंदु पर हैं जहां हम स्त्री की स्वतंत्रता को न तो पूरी तरह से परिभाषित कर सके और न हमारा जो पारंपरिक संस्था है परिवार की वह उसको परिवार की ही नहीं विवाह की वह उस स्वतंत्रता को स्वीकार कर पाया है तो भारतीय समाज को जब बार बार यह कहा जाता रहा है और सैद्धांतिक तौर पर मैं थोड़ा सरलिक करके बात कर रहा हूँ आशीष नंदी जैसे लोग कहते रहे हैं कि धर्म निरपेक्षता ने भारतीय चेतना में एक बहुत बड़ी फाक पैदा कर दी और और उसकी वजह से संप्रदायवाद ने यहाँ जड़ जमाई 
तो मेरे सामने हमेशा यह प्रश्न रहा है कि जिस सामुदायिकता की वे बात करते हैं और जिस पारंपरिकता की बात करते हैं वह अंततः व्यक्ति की रक्षा कैसे कर सकेगा या अंततः वह स्वतंत्रता की जो धारणा है जो सिर्फ पश्चिम की उपलब्धि नहीं है आप उसे फ्रांसिस क्रांति से जोड़ के देख सकते हैं वहां से पैदा हुई चीज देख सकते हैं लेकिन स्वतंत्रता अब अंतता हम सबका अधिकार है तो उसकी रक्षा आप कैसे कर सकेंगे अगर आप धर्म निरपेक्षता के सिद्धांत का अभ्यास नहीं करते हैं और यहाँ मैं अपनी बात खत्म करना चाहूंगा और यह बात राजश्री ने अपनी किताब में लिखी भी और ये हम सारे लोग जानते हैं कि भारतीय धर्म निरपेक्षता ने एक नई राह भी खोली थी जो फ्रांसीसी धर्म निरपेक्षता या यूरोपीय धर्म निरपेक्षता की अवधारणा से अलग है और इसलिए उसमें बहुत सारी संभावनाएं थी हमने सैद्धांतिक तौर पर उन संभावनाओं को खोलने की जगह अः मैं ये जो कि मुठा के कह रहा हूँ कि हमने उस पर आक्रमण आरंभ कर दिया और उसकी साख खत्म करने की कोशिश की और इस वजह से सिविक नेशनलिज्म का जो वादा था उस उस वादे को हासिल करने के पहले हम एक तरह की उल्टी यात्रा में चले गए मैं ए, एक बार फिर का शुक्रिया अदा करता हूँ इसलिए कि जैसा मैंने कहा कि उस सड़क से गुजरते हुए अब मुझे उन सारी वो जो वो द्वंद थे जो उस व्यक्ति के भीतर थे उनका एहसास होगा और सड़क एक निष्क्रिय सड़क नहीं मालूम पड़ेगी में जाती और दूसरे के इस किताब से हमें और बहुत सारे ऐसे आत्मीय जीवनियों की आवश्यकता महसूस होगी और शायद बहुत सारे लोग ऐसी जीवनियां फिर लिखेंगे बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया थैंक यू प्रोफेसर अपूर्वादन फॉर दिस एक्सट्रीमली सेंसिटिव a uh, reading sensitive and nuanced reading of rajshree's book and i'm sure there'll be lots to talk about but uh, before we start a conversation with the audience and now I'd like to invite professor nigam to share his thoughts thank you antara thank you uh, jdm uh, college and uh, rajshree of course uh, for this uh, opportunity to discuss this uh, fascinating book uh, actually when uh, rajshri uh, was speaking uh, i and when apurvanand in fact was giving his his own uh, reflections on the book <laughs> i was actually uh, thinking of uh, one thing which has always uh, attracted me or in a, in a way uh, which uh, if i may put it the other way around has put me off in in terms of very flat accounts of this or that choices between let us say ethnic nationalism and civic nationalism and so on or choices between secularism and communalism is because most of the time what we encounter are figures like jagat narayan rao most of the time what we encounter in real life what gramsci calls contradictory consciousness if you have actually uh, states what he calls uh, stone age um, consciousness or stone age uh, attitudes alongside very modern ones <laughs> and so in a sense this is not something which uh, relates only to uh, to the uh, specific a uh, figure of uh, jagat narayan dal the, uh, the the book actually is a fascinating account of the life of uh, somebody who happens to be uh, rajshree's grandfather but with whom we uh, get to be uh, acquainted uh, as an important figure of the anti colonial struggle especially in bihar through his activities where so uh, his activities were certainly not confined to bihar uh, and we get to know a full lot of uh, dimensions of a personality uh, some of which apurvanand has touched and rajshree's introductory remarks also touched i will try and avoid repeating all that 
But apart from his other Olympia level engagement, he was also, for instance, also a member of the Constituent Assembly and after independence in one of the earliest assignments, and one of the four members of the Linguistic Provinces Commission, also known as the Dar Commission, which uh, Rajshri had mentioned. <laughs> Rajshri's account of his life is a sympathetic but not unrecon uncritical reconstruction and narration that sees his life and what she calls his inheritance of contradictions <clears throat> as an arena where many different modalities of nationalist engagement play out. The person Jagat Narayan emerges through her account as a person, an individual who is an embodiment of many selves, as she puts it, <clears throat> and to put it in her words, the suffering slash desiring body, the seeking mind, the absent husband, the unconcerned father, the respectful son, nationalist, the congressman, the Hindu Mahasabhaik, the Gandhian becoming so many aspects of itself, so that the self is no longer self-centered or self-centered in quotes because it is here not referring to self-centered in the sense of, in the sense in which we understand it as uh, fixated on the self, but in a more philosophical sense. As, as a self which is centered or anchored in its own interests as well. Rajshri calls it the decentered self invoking Foucault. But what kept what kept coming back to me and struck me uh, from my very uh, initial uh, familiarity with this domain was the way in which her reconstruction of his life recalls the idea of the Buddhist idea idea of the self as an assemblage of five numbers of the five aggregates <clears throat> uh, just to quickly recall which actually uh, I see at play in a way in the way in the way she narrates uh, the contradictions of it, the contradictions and the the, uh, the uh, different uh, components of itself <laughs> so the Pyaskanda, the, the body, the Rupaskanda, which is the aggregate of the body and materiality, and the Skanda, the aggregate of feeling and sensation, Vedana, the aggregate of perceptions and recognition, Sanya, <coughs> and the Samskara Skanda, which is the aggregate of desires, wishes, opinions, prejudices, very important to keep in mind. <coughs> and finally, <coughs> consciousness which is actually an awareness of all these other things. <clears throat> so in a sense, the idea of the five skandhas, as the Buddhists would say, is essentially to underline that every aspect of our lives is a collection of constantly engaging experiences, the changing experiences. There is no <clears throat> none that is permanent or unique. Everything is not only in flux. It is also dependent upon multiple causes and conditions. <clears throat> Consciousness too can therefore not remain unchanged. And so, <clears throat> when we look at uh, Jagat Narayan's self in that sense, it's not unique uh, either and exemplifies the ways in which each of these aspects goes into the production of a self that, even when explicitly fashioned in the ascetic modality, as in the early phase of his life, his political life, uh, not quite a fixed and permanent self. So we see through Rajshri's narrative, the Dathnarayan Lal's <coughs> life moved from the ascetic nationalist phase to the Hindu nationalist one, <coughs> which while being more concerned with the Hindu identity, with Hindu identity vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim other, and despite involvement with the Hindu Mahasabha, remains resolutely away from the more malign manifestations of the creed associated with the Hindu other. <clears throat> Rajshri sees the first phase of ascetic nationalism itself as contradictory, <clears throat> that is, in his life, <clears throat> with the opposition to material self-interest being central to ascetic. So the contradiction in this idea of uh, uh, ascetic nationalism, where the opposition to material self-interest <clears throat> are central to ascetic, whereas nationalism demands engagement precisely with that word, with the word which Asceticism, asceticism seeks to renounce. <clears throat> in the history of Indian nationalism, this tension is partly resolved through the introduction of the idea of the Karma Yogi via Vivekananda Gandhi and others that Jagat Narayan also 
<laughs> because uh, Rajshri, Rajshri's narrative is entirely located in the political realm, the personal or familial actually appears almost as an unwarranted intrusion. It would have been interesting, however, to see how the turn to asceticism and brahmacharya actually impinges on the family and gender dimension of the much denigrated worldly life. <clears throat> no doubt, <clears throat> the story goes far back in history, right back to the time when Siddharth Gautam abandoned his wife and sleeping child and family responsibilities in the dead of the night and left in pursuit of the larger metaphysical quest. <clears throat> and it is a question that is <clears throat> question that has often been asked, especially by uh, feminists. In Jagat Narayan's context, what does it mean in terms of the pain and agony of Brahmacharya Giri? His wife, who was neither allowed to touch him nor sleep next to him once he returned after serving in his prison term and vowing to observe Brahmacharya. <laughs> in a somewhat displaced sense, what does it mean when his political phase, when in his political phases, he not only repeatedly goes to jail, but <clears throat> he even he even he doesn't and he, he, he doesn't and is he's never available to his, for his children to whom generally pride in their parents' careers, this I'm quoting, uh, pride in quoting from the book, pride in the parents' careers achieve, and achievements took a backseat to stories of negligence and penury. As Rajshri puts it, here was a household of 10 children and a few grandchildren living with parents who had active political careers in a family where the main breadwinner had sacrificed his legal career responding to Gandhi's call for non-cooperation. <clears throat> of course, in this case, it should be clarified that Rampere Devi was herself an active participant in, participant in the anti-colonial struggle and was jailed during the Quit India movement. <clears throat> but I raise this question for another reason. I do not think that politics can provide its own critique, for its own existence is predicated on the reduction, rejection of the much maligned, mundane, and the everyday. <clears throat> The world of power and politics exists as, as a glorified world that prides itself in the rejection of other responsibilities, of a personal and familiar view. I raise this question here not only in the context of Jagat Narayan Lal, but actually to raise questions about the very thing called politics in modern times, which seeks to envelop all our being. <laughs> of course, the specific context of colonialism and the struggle for national liberation often leaves very little choice for many people, as it did, <coughs> as it did not for both Jagat Narayan and Ram Karigo. But the question, nevertheless, is worth asking in a larger sense. And of course, I raise this question because Rajshri's political theorist self, too, is very much present in the way she asks questions of her grandfather's life and theorizes them, but almost as a kind of injunction of the political in the political theorist you have to evade the personal. It seems like you have to evade and slip away the personal and the familial into some other corner by quickly moving past it. And, and, and I think that it is a question which raises existential questions. It is, it, it is a problem it raises which uh, have to do not only with the critique of politics, <clears throat> but also how might we think the, the contradictions that uh, Rajshri narrates through the book, I am not actually interested in the uh, only in the political part, which is of course there, but what actually is happening existentially, <clears throat> and how are hundreds and thousands of people thrown into these situations, situations periodically, and the phase of Hindu nationalism in Jagat Narayan's life is eventually quite rapidly superseded by the phase of anti-colonial Very soon, his political commitments to Gandhi and the Congress, to freedom of the country from colonial rule, pit him against the Hindu Mahasabha and such other outfits to adopt a more collaborative stance vis-a-vis -vis -vis the British ruler while attacking the Congress. This is also a phase when a different idea of <coughs> nationhood starts taking shape and which is to take the form of what Rajshri called civic nationalism. I will not go into a discussion of that phase 
that we see in evidence in the debates in the Constituent Assembly and on, in the various rules played uh, by him after in the first independence period, because these conform more clearly to the kind of Congress leader or activist that we are accustomed to. By this time, many of the contradictions in, have been ironed out. The situation has changed, and the responsibility of building a new and independent nation is now at hand. What I think calls for a little reflection here is, and I will end with this, the question of Hinduism. And the Hindu consciousness that we see in the Ratnaran, especially in the earlier phases of this political life. Though this is not something that disappears later, it continues to remain, but is no longer the driver of his politics. Let me just uh, connect here with the point with which Apurvanan started about forgetting, uh, about the need to forget. This is the point actually Jagat Narayan Lal is making, invoking Renan's famous uh, thesis of nationalism, that nations exist only to the extent that they are able to uh, forget past conflicts. And uh, in a sense, a nation that, that famous essay in which he talks about the nation as nation's existence as being a daily plebiscite. So, in a way, that question of forgetfulness, uh, which brings up the question of memory, which brings up this whole idea of Hinduism, actually uh, needs to be, this is not the place to go into a detailed discussion on that, but it needs to be asked also how much of that memory is actually memory, and how much of it is produced through historical accounts, which are uh, then kind of uh, retroactively constituted as part of our authentic memory of our past. And before the late 19th century, in fact, early 20th century, we had no idea of the Harappan civilization or anything of that sort. The first things that we found in the 1890s uh, while digging a rail line. Uh, gave an indication of something, it was actually not really taken up and finally the uh, full extent of the Indus Valley civilization only started coming to light in the 1910s and 1920s. <laughs> and that is when a memory is sort of retros retrospectively constructed. So this question of memory and forgetting is a far more complicated question than one can go into here. But I want to just end with, with this question of Hinduism in this one respect. Now, it is true that right through the latter half of the 19th century, a certain Hindu consciousness starts acquiring a pervasive form. So what we see in the emergence of the Savarkarite Hindutva and the RSS later certainly displays a, displays a certain continuity with the ideas that continue to be expounded during this earlier period. And yet, Hindutva is not simply a natural development of those ideas, but indeed marks a profound rupture. The term Hindutva is not used by Savarkar for the first time, but actually by people like Chandranath Basu in Bengal in 1892, in his text Hindutva, Hindu, Prakriti Itihar. And that, that was when uh, it is you know, apparently also uses the term, but uh, Chandranath Basu actually writes a full uh, text <coughs> on, which is titled Hindu. But neither Basu nor Vivekananda's muscular missionary notion of Hinduism and Hindu can be considered the natural ancestors of the Savarkarite entity, which defined itself primarily through Muslim hatred, <coughs> which is not the case with these earlier forms of Hindu consciousness which are coming into existence, even though there is a vague sense of the Muslim mother but it never actually acquired this kind of malignant form. In that sense, what the Savarkarite intervention did was to pick up many of those ideas, but use them to forge a particular kind of politics that cannot but be seen as marking a break from the earlier interpretation. And I think this part is reflected very nicely in the way in which the Hinduness that continuously frames uh, the protagonist of this book uh, Jagat Narayan Lal, uh, how he uh, 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 embodies a certain stance of Hinduism, Hindu, uh, which is very different from 
these later uh, incarnations. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dikam, for this uh, brilliantly critical reading, in fact, of uh, Rajshree's work. And, you know, you anticipate some of the questions that even I had of Rajshree, which I'm sure we'll have time to uh, discuss. Um, but uh, would you like to respond to uh, Rajshree? Would you like to respond to Professor Nikam and Apurvanand? And then we can go on to the questions. I uh, I wasn't able to hear Raditho's uh... Uh, some of the, the sound was actually breaking off. Uh, but from what I'm able to understand, I have two quick responses. These are, uh, these are much questions of much deeper explorations, uh, especially about the, the idea of forgetting and forgetfulness. And I do take his point that, uh, uh, but I would like to go back to what uh, Apurvanand said is that, uh, if we stay away from the idea of authentic memory of, uh, or if we give in to the idea of which memory has been retrospectively constructed and which memory actually is um, authentic or actually moored in uh, those times, we give in to an idea of competing for authenticity and who is to adjudicate that. But I also take your point that we cannot leave the field of authenticity completely open and relative to individual interpretations and political connotations. So it is indeed a far more complex project than simply uh, choosing to forget something. Um, your the, really, the, I was not. I just I should say I I am not at all an advocate of authenticity. I was just saying that this question is complicated. But that doesn't mean that I'm actually uh, advocating any kind of authentic. Uh... No, I understand. I understand. I mean, uh, uh, even as far as, uh, I mean, just as a personal anecdote, uh, my father-in-law uh, has gone through partition. The kind of memory that he invokes of the partition, very often you get the sense that it is retrospectively created. And who is to adjudicate uh, on how much of that sense of victimhood is to, uh, is to uh, become a part of contemporary politics and our contemporary stance on, uh, on, uh, uh, on our identities and our uh, perceptions of who is a good citizen, who is a bad citizen, who is a rightful one, who is not. So it is indeed a complex and, a, and, a, and, a, and an idea which is fraught with multiple, both multiple um, interpretations as well as um, so something that one needs to uh, tread a little more carefully, I guess, and, and, and a deeper exploration is needed. And perhaps on a case-to-case -case basis, one needs to understand. On the other point that Aditya, you raised about uh, the personal and the political, uh, let me know if I have understood you correctly, because as I said, your voice was cracking up a little bit. Uh, from what I understand, uh, why is there a construction of the political which tries to evade the personal? And even as I am uh, developing a narrative, even as I'm writing about my grandfather, why is there an endeavor at all to evade or to erase my, my personal self in order to recover a authentic political unmediated by personal uh, consciousness subjectivity? Is that so? Did I? Not so much, no, no, not so much. Again, not so much, at, at, not at all about authenticity. It's more of actually a comment on what we understand of politics and its relationship to the everyday through the life of Devat Narayan. So, but this is actually an instantiation of one person's life, mm -hmm. but a question which, which is why I said it goes back to Buddha uh, leaving his family and, uh, uh, and, and, and going away to uh, innumerable people, lesser known people, old timers in communist movements and so on, who actually leave, left their families, uh, went away to live in communes, went away to live in villages, to fight, organize, die unsung. 
it's a larger and much more difficult existential question. But what happens to families which are left? My own grandfather went to prison uh, two, three times. And my grandmother with no income had to bring up uh, four or five children. One of them died. Uh, so this is the story which actually I wanted to kind of just flag uh, to raise certain existential questions which come up apart from the political one. This is of course there. The political one is quite obvious. So that it was not so much about uh, your, my quip about uh, your evasion is the is the quip about political theory. <laughs> it's not about, say, say that again. Say that again. <laughs> it is about political theory that the polit that political theory is not able to understand the personalist politically, if I may say it, uh, put it like that, or because perhaps we need to think these things in a more existential uh, way. Now. May I, may I just add to what Aditya just said is that, uh, you know, in the beginning of the book, you, you do talk about how, uh, fam I mean, his family members and, uh, you know, the way they regarded the sacrifices or the commitments that Jagat Narayan Lal ha had. But when, as the narrative progresses, you don't really hear those voices uh, very much, you know, or those perhaps family, I mean, intimate de detractors, not political detractors, but, um, you know, intimate detractors, number one. And it's very interesting a bit that you write in your book where when he hears the news of his wife's death and the, the difference in his response when he hears his, about his wife's death and when he hears about his father's death. So, you know, if there is, there was something over there, you know, you don't, you don't pick it up. And I, I think it would have been interesting to also, uh, you know, connect this whole idea of uh, aesthetic uh, nationalist self, which Jagat Narayan Lal is uh, constructing and uh, the idea of it being also very gendered in a way and whether, you know, within the context of the time, whether there were other narratives, uh, you know, available. Uh, to him which he either was not either he was not hearing them or he chose not to hear them so that that little bit i think i don't know whether Aditya, I, I i got you uh, correctly or not i think that little bit and uh, so the the whole attempt of jagat narayan lal of creating an aesthetic self which frees himself or at least attempts to free himself from family ties in the narrative interestingly you follow the same pattern you know where gradually you go more and more into his public self and uh, you know leave out uh, the familial and I, I thought it was just an interesting observation I don't know if you can respond there were, uh, there were there were two constraints if I may call yes. it that one uh, one was uh, that many of his children had died by now. And uh, the memory that people like my father or my uncle, one of the Bua, my Buas died during the writing of the book itself. Mm. Uh, the memory that they had was very unilinear and there was no way of me to judge how much of it was uh, some of the stories that came through were stories of valor and what he did during communal riots, etc. And there was no way for me to establish whether these were uh, family stories that have gathered a little bit of uh, um, valor and interesting tidbits as, as, as they roll along. Uh, the other constraint was my own training as a political scientist. I have to find a political story in everything I write. Uh, it is it is both uh, 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 <laughs> an asset as well as a limitation. Uh, when I write about politics, uh, it comes more easily, and uh, which is why I was I was floundering initially when I began writing. I was just you know completely taken over by the idea of how to write a political story. So uh, years of training, it is. Uh, you know, uh, I, I, if Soumya is here, uh, Soumya often makes a critical, uh, a jibe at political scientists and says that every good political scientist eventually wants to write history. And so uh, 
you know, I was so conscious of the fact that here is a political scientist attempting to enter, you know, recklessly into another field of uh, writing history. So the training comes in between. There is a, you know, not for nothing is something called a discipline. The disciplinary training kind of intrudes and invades and uh, directs you in many unprecedented and unforeseen ways. Uh, so perhaps that. Um, I was asked this question at another book discussion. Why isn't there more of Rampyari Devi, uh, uh, you know, your grandmother who uh, was also in active politics and what must life have been for her? And um, I mean, I just take on board that I did, didn't have material and I didn't know what to do with the existing stories that I had of both, uh, you know, they are very, very uh, intimate family stories. I just didn't know what to do with them. As simple as that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Because you mentioned Soumya and history and political science, I am, uh, you know, a student of literature, and we and uh, Professor Purvanand will uh, probably agree. And you know, we in literature departments constantly uh, moan the fact that we don't have more kind of concrete methodologies. That we all want to be historians and political scientists. Literature people have this huge aspiration to be political scientists and historians. Uh, before I go to the audience question, Professor Pal is here. Would you like to say yeah, something? Yeah, I raised my hand because yeah. I couldn't resist when I heard uh, Rajshri refer to Soumya. Uh, <laughs> I must tell you uh, that I don't know about uh, this aspiration to write history or to write, uh, you know, uh, 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 something more inclined towards politics. I don't know, Antara, but you've also read the book. And, you know, this, this literary quality to, the, to your writing, which I must tell you, yes. fascinates me. A lot of political scientists write most, polit most poetically. And your narration in great parts, I could almost convert it into a poem. It was so beautifully, uh, you know, written. I have to say that to you. That is one of, for me, uh, you know, with my kind of training, that was definitely a... Uh, something that kept me hooked on. And it's not just for this writing of yours, uh, the, of this biography, but for all of your writing. I, I find that the, the soul of, a, you know, of what we literature walas would like to, uh, uh, you know, claim as our own, uh, definitely there amongst hardcore, ruthless political scientists. Of course, these are all such labels. But anyway, it was fascinating and I really have to thank you, Apurvananji and Aditya Niganji for, you know, your, uh, as Antara put it, very sensitive, very uh, incisive engagement with, with Rajshri's book. And thank you, Antara. Very quickly, I want to respond to something that I picked up from Apurvanand's uh, uh, comments. Uh, there is a term that Apurvanand ap use karte hain, samvidhan ka abhyas. Uh, that particular uh, that particular political practice and how you picked it up from the routine practices, uh, both political and physical practices of Jagat Narayan Lal, the idea that constitutionalism or constitutional morality has to become part of our abhyas and an everyday political practice. It has to be embedded sort of more personally and perhaps intimately and politically in our everyday practices is, is, is a, it's, a, it's a very um, evocative uh, formulation, Samvidhan ka bhyas. So, thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to read out a couple of questions. Would, uh, do you want me to read out one question at a time or do, uh, should I read out more? Take, take a couple. Maybe, all right, okay, just take a couple. Maybe they are, they are questions for others yeah, to connected, yeah. connected, yes. So the first question comes from Vikram. Professor Chandra mentions ascetic nationalism as the first type amongst the competing nationalisms. It was not explained. Uh, this is what. Uh, and the next one is congratulations, Rajshri, for such a wonderful book. Civic nationalism seems quite oxymoronic to me. Isn't the centrality of state um, with its surrogates whipping up nationalism on behalf of capital is missing civic nationalism? And a question from Nivedita Menon, which I have. And can you can you just repeat the last one, please? All right, um, Rajshri. Uh, okay, 
the question was civic nationalism seems quite oxymoronic. oxymoronic. Right? Huh? Isn't the centrality of state with its surrogates whipping up nationalism on behalf of capital uh, and which is missing in civic nationalism? I think, you know, there might be one or two uh, words missing here. So that's the question. And um, yeah, and this is a comment uh, from Nibedita Menon. Congratulations, Rajshri, on what is evidently a textured and fascinating account of a complex historical figure through whom you tease out the larger questions around nationalism and the contradictions within which it dwells. And she thanks uh, JDMC and CSDS for enabling this very rich discussion and thanks to the panelists for their thoughtful engagement with Rini's book. <laughs> Yes. So would you like to, these are the three questions that at least I can see. So uh, if you would want to uh, kind of answer this question, uh, I think Vikram says that uh, the idea of uh, competing na ascetic nationalism as the first type amongst competing nationalisms is uh, maybe. There's you know, one in the Q&A, Antara. There's one in the Q&A. Oh, so these are the questions that I've got. Uh, Yes, and there's someone uh, called Raju Keshri. How do you look at the larger question of personal and political from the prism of equality, liberty, and fraternity being championed by a section of the intelligentsia at that time? Yes. Okay, so on... Ascetic nationalism, this is uh, uh, just a short, uh, the idea was to, uh, as, as Aditya also mentioned, the idea was to fashion a, a decentered self. It was to fashion a self which could not be harmed. In a sense, if you allowed yourself to suffer, if you allowed yourself to be harmed, if you um, became a suffering self, you are admitting to the power of uh, to, to the power of the colonial masters to hurt you. In fashioning a self which is so detached, which has let go of material attachments, which has detached itself, which has renounced desire, you are also fashioning a self which is incapable of, of which is uh, which is uh, which protects itself from uh, uh, from uh, the torment and the trauma which is being inflicted through jail terms and the sedition charges and the various other charges which are being inflicted so the idea is to uh, uh, in that sense renunciation detachment becomes fashioning of a political self a self which is mobilized not just uh, in, 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 in fashioning another uh, identity, in fashioning another self, but also a self that is mobilized in service of a larger entity which called the nation, nation state. Uh, so that is uh, one response. The other is, uh, thank you, uh, Nivi, for your, for your comments. Um, the personal is political. In the realm of Raju, I uh, uh, would be happy if you could explain your question. I'm not sure if I've got your question correctly. Um, how did the liberty, equality, and fraternity... Um, let me think about this, take a couple of more questions and come back on this because... Um, Raju, are you there? Will you be able to unmute yourself and explain your question, please? Uh... I don't know whether that function is available or okay. not. But uh, very quickly, I mean, uh, in terms of the spirit of fraternity, Jagat Narayan Lal, despite, I mean, I can only take his example here, despite his uh, very, uh, very strong Hindu self and identity, he has a number of Muslim friends and collaborators and compatriots who he is in deep admiration. In fact, uh, he became uh, the, uh, you know, he, he, he made Sadaqat Ashram, which was so named by Mazarul Haq as his uh, political abode that became the site for Bihar Vidya Peet, where uh, he is also a professor of economics. So the idea of fraternity actually is something which underlay 
both their personal and their political lives very, very uh, sort of uh, in, in a uh, extremely intertwined manner. As far as liberty uh, is concerned, personal freedom was articulated by Jagat Narayan Lal only in the context of uh, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of speech, uh, freedom to uh, uh, practice your own religion, etc. So uh, there is no glimpse into how you know, that became a personal uh, uh, motivation. Also, we have to understand that the idea of liberty itself was in a sense of social and political liberty, something that was inspired by and something which was borrowed from the West. Uh, as an Indic value, liberty is not something which has become part of our personal lives, uh, which was mediating either uh, a relationship between a husband and a wife or a parent and children or uh, a, a, a compatriot, a patriot and the larger society. So the articulation of liberty is purely in the political realm. Uh, uh, the idea of equality, as far as Jagat Narayan Lal is concerned, uh, very interestingly, there is a strong strand of thinking around issues of equity and uh, social justice, uh, whether it is uh, uh, his championing the cause of labor rights or whether uh, it is about uh, uh, championing the cause of uh, agricultural peasants. So there is an idea of, um, there is a long tract which is not part of the book where he's, uh, uh, where he's uh, challenging the whole idea of, of uh, Alfred Marshall's distinction that is drawn by Alfred Marshall between private property and public property. And uh, so uh, there is an idea of a larger social idea of equity, uh, which is articulated by Jagat Narayan Lal. Uh, Raju, if that answers your question. Thank you, Rajshree. Uh, I have two questions from Ravika. Um, I'll read out both together. I have walked that road several times since 1980. So this is a fellow Bihari speaking. Congratulations, <laughs> Rajshree. And I'm also curious, just a second. Uh, yeah, I'm curious uh, to learn more about his journalistic practices, especially his paper, Mahavir. How long did it run, etc.? And the second question he has is, I also wanted to know about his stance vis-a-vis -vis caste politics in Bihar. Again, this is a question that even I had. Thank you, Ravikan. Over to you, Rajshree. Yeah. So uh, Mahavir starts in the early, uh, early to mid-1920s uh, uh, through Sri Krishna Press. Uh, he was a Krishna Bhakt. Um, and uh, his first child was named uh, my... Uh, my Taya was named Krishna. And so Krishna Press uh, took out this journal called Mahavir. Uh, despite my most valiant attempts, I could not lay my hands on a single copy of Mahavir. The only reference I found uh, of uh, Mahavir was in the, were in two cases in the Bihar archives. One was the Mahavir sedition case, which will give you a glimpse of what uh, Mahavir was about. And the other was, uh, very interestingly, and let me first talk about that. So uh, Mahavir at one point of time carried a, uh, an advertisement, and I mentioned, I think, in the book as well, of, uh, of a book which is called Kok Shastra. So the last, uh, the back cover of the book actually carries that advertisement. And this was in 1926 or 27. And there is a complaint filed for obscenity. And uh, he was charged with obscenity. There was, there was a pre-trial which happened. Um, what was Mahavir about? Uh, Mahavir was uh, from, so the sedition charge that my grandfather, that Jagat Narayan Lal faced in 1928, for which he served a jail sentence of one year, uh, was ostensibly uh, for, was because he was critical of Lord Irwin's uh, government and bureaucracy for uh, flaming communal tensions and for fanning communal fires. And he is, uh, so there are uh, extracts from Mahavir uh, in the court case and the, the entire court case and the judgment is there in the archives. So Mahavir was uh, broadly took two stands, Ravikant. One was uh, 
strictly as an anti-colonial, uh, anti-imperialist, a critique of the British government, and two, to represent the Hindu interests. And it is for this reason that often it is uh, considered to be uh, a journal which was, which was uh, heightening or lending to uh, uh, exacerbation of communal passions. On caste itself, very interesting uh, 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 question. Um, Jagat Narayan Lal surprisingly is very, very uh, progressive as far as that is concerned. Uh, as far, I mean, the material that came to my hand. He is, um, so he's, uh, if you have read so, some parts of the book, he's very troubled uh, by the conversions that are happening in the Chota Nagpur area and in the, uh, in, uh, the Assam Northeast region of Assam and neighboring areas. And uh, one of the, it is, it is a pain and it is an ang to the point of being an anguish that he says, sees that, you know, uh, thousands of people are being converted from Hinduism to Christianity. And he's very, very critical uh, of the conversion, but the, but the anger and the anguish is not so much against the Christians. In fact, he wants, but it is against the practice of priesthood, number one, and number two, the caste system, which is not serving the cause of the marginalized and poor of the society. His entire idea of Sangathan actually was more to organize and to refashion uh, 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 caste equations. And, and uh, so there is a, a, a Satyagraha that has, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that had motivated him a lot, which, which was in Bengal, Tarkeshwar Satyagraha. And he wants to launch a satyagraha against the priestly class and of the uh, uh, temple endowments that they uh, sort of corner and misuse and the corrupt practices. So both against the Brahmanical and he's extremely pained by the kind of support that they get both from the landed zamindars as well as from uh, his critical of uh, Madan Mohan Malviya, his critical of Rajinder Prasad, uh, he, he says that even uh, they turned a blind eye to these practices and to the idea of attacking the priestly class and the Brahmins because Brahmin support is so strong. So uh, he's unafraid to actually launch an attack both against the priestly class and the Brahmins as well as take up the cause of uh, uh, the underprivileged and uh, the, the, the tribals and the uh, Dalit communities. Thank you, Rajshri. Now, a congratulatory message from Deborah. She says, thanks indeed to both organizers and panelists, the most engaging event. I'm following you from Italy. This, these kind of conversations should be better known in Europe as they are so rich uh, of insights on political identity, nationhood, citizenship, and, uh, and the, an individual and a collective selfhood. Uh, so we are all very pleased. Uh, this, uh, the next question comes from Soumya. Many congratulations, Rajshri, for this wonderful book. I still remember the excitement when you discovered your grandfather's papers. My question is connected to what Professor Purvanand also pointed out, the struggle of memory against forgetting versus the need to forget to enable future solidarities. This was a concern when historians opened up to op oral histories about the partition and also with notions of truth and reconciliation. So. Here is a historian's question to a political scientist. <laughs> I um, so need to forget vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the ability to forget. Um, I will have to take this question on board and think more about it. This is this is something that uh, needs a deeper reflection on the project of memory. Uh, forgetting of reconnaissance of reconciliation uh, of truth telling um, how much of it uh, can be enabled how much of history how much of our contemporary politics can be enabled by forgetting is a question which is uh, fraught with anxieties at one level uh, we may admit to the need for forgetting but obviously it is not something that that uh, that can be done uh, without taking on board 
the multiple issues of reconciliation, the multiple issues of uh, uh, unnegotiated hurt, unnegotiated um, trauma that people have undergone. Uh, on the one hand, we can, uh, perhaps it is a broad brush to say that hence the need for forgetfulness in the uh, building of nationhood. Um, but this need at one level also glosses over um, uh, the, 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 the kind of experiential trauma and, and, and uh, uh, hurt that people have undergone in the past. And uh, so, yeah, this this perhaps needs the, uh, the when how much of forgetfulness do you privilege? How much of forgetfulness do you back? And how much you let go? Uh, and how much you admit uh, memory and reconciliation to inflect your uh, personal politics is something that has to be. It's it's an ongoing project. It is something that happens perhaps um, as we move along and there is no resolution of one or the other. Yeah? Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yes Adit. No, Rajshri, I think Sonia's question also has another aspect. I don't want to prolong the session, but I, I think what she's referring to is the project of uh, knowledge itself, our going, for example, the historians uh, doing oral histories of partition, people who had wanted to forget being actually uh, asked to relive, uh, could be, I mean, in that sense, our production of our, our production of knowledge about trauma and traumatic events uh, itself uh, adumberates against the, the, not just the need, but actually a lived practice of forgetting. People couldn't have lived after 1984 or uh, any of that if they had continuously lived that pain. So in a sense, you do try to forget and put it behind you, but then comes along an academic saying, okay, tell us what happened. And, uh, and, and in a way, uh, all the uh, trauma that you were trying to pack up and put in your loft suddenly has to be now brought out and displayed in public and so on. So there is something here, which is, I think, in Samaya's question, which is more than just a need to forget. There is something about the... Uh, no, apart, apart from... Uh, the, you could have a certain... Uh, 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 a memory project which, or, or, or a social group which is actually wanting to forget and not relive the, those memories. Alongside you also may have a, have, a, uh, have a need for reconciliation and a reconnaissance and, and a sense of justice and a sense of wanting to keep that memory and that trauma alive so that you do not forget what history owes you or what uh, the need for that reconciliation and closure. So, uh, these are two projects that exist side by side. I mean, there is no uh, one way to adjudicate or one way to, uh, to uh, take forward the memory project. You, you uh, alongside the fact that you have people wanting to uh, have a need to forget or wanting to forget and not li reliving the trauma is also an idea of people not wanting to forget and wanting to keep a certain memory and, a, and, and the sense of, Pending justice, as it were, alive. Um, but yeah, we'll 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 perhaps probe this further and think deeper on this. Thank you so much, uh, Rajshree, Professor Nigam, Professor Purvanand, for this absolutely fascinating discussion, brilliant discussion, and I can't recommend the book enough. You know, I can't tell you how much I learned uh, from the book. And I, it is going to be my go-to book, uh, you know, for for many things and on many issues. And it's a book which needs to be read and reread. And I think everyone should read the book. I mean, uh, anyone who wants to understand contemporary politics, particularly, you know, it's a it's a book which is, I think, a must-read. Uh, so I will uh, now hand over uh, the 
uh, session to Suman Gupta, who will do the vote of thanks. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed an honor to offer a vote of thanks on the occasion of the book discussion on competing nationalisms, the secret and political life of Jagat Narayan Lal, organized jointly by Department of Political Science, Janki Devi Memorial College, and Center for the Study of Developing Societies. <clears throat> On behalf of the entire Political Science Department of JDMC, I would like to take this opportunity to place on record our hearty thanks to Professor Abdhendra Sharan, Director, CSDS, for the collaboration and perfect support in planning the event. Thank you, sir. I want to extend my generous thanks to Professor Swati Pal, our principal JDMC, for her motivation, dedicated supervision, and guidance, which is always forthcoming to us. Thank you, ma'am. Professor Rashi Chandra, the author of the book, has done a tremendous job in writing this biography of her grandfather and introducing us to Jagat Babu and his journey as an ascetic Hindu nationalist, freedom fighter, and uh, civic nationalism. We all are really proud of you, Rashri. I also extend my thanks to Professor Aditya Nigam, CSDS, for sharing his valuable views. I offer my gratitude to Professor Apuru Anand, Department of Hindi, Delhi University, for expressing his views on nationalism and both the discussions have enriched our knowledge on the subject. Dr. Antra Datta from JDMC has been a wonderful as a moderator. Antra, your energy is really uh, unmatchable and sometimes infectious too. Uh, well, an event cannot happen overnight. It requires detailed planning and we are very fortunate to have a team of dedicated colleagues, Dr. Renuka Singh, Dr. Deepshika Shahi, Dr. Zubair Ahmed, and Mr. Praveen Rai, who worked relentlessly and organized such a fabulous event. Thank you. Thanks are in order to Mr. Raju Keshri for his enormous cooperation in the organization of this event and logistic support. He is also a colleague in JDMC. Our dear student, Ms. Tashvi Chavla, needs to be appreciated for the beautiful poster designed and created by her. I sincerely thank Mr. Ayodhya Verma for his technical support. And last but not the least, our audience. How can there be a program without the participants? So thank you all for being such captive and interactive audience and for your nice questions. Once again, I thank you all for making the event a grand success. Thank you. <laughs>